Welcome to Smith Weekly's discussions and occasional program for our members of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position along with your favorite beverage to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine our show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we want to say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Vigo O, Todd A, at I M M Prim, and Jacques Mullen O. On the program today is a new guest of a returning company. Mr. Guillermo Pensado is with us. Guillermo is the Vice President of Exploration and Development at Blue Sky Uranium. The company is focused on uranium project exploration and development in Argentina. With the advanced exploration stage Amarillo Grande uranium project in Rio Negro province of southern Argentina. Blue Sky Uranium is listed on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol BSK, as well as on the US OTC markets under the symbol BKUCF. Guillermo, welcome to the podcast. Hi, good morning. Thanks for inviting me and pleasure to be talking with uh, our audience here. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you on the program. Well, you're a new guest for us representing Blue Sky. Why don't you start off here with giving the audience a flavor of your background and experience in this junior natural resource sector? Well, I'm an Argentine geologist, more than 30 years as a professional. Uh, and I've been involved in mining exploration for three decades now and recognized the, the tremendous geological potential that these countries have in, in many commodities. Uh, I have a background also in mineral exploration from Queen's University in Canada as a master's degree. And in the last more than 15 years now, well involved in the uranium exploration sector, uh, which is really a great place to be involved in because, I mean, Argentina, as I mentioned, has significant geological potential, but in uranium in particular, due to our tectonic location, uh, we have significant uh, uranium potential to be discovered but because the exploration was very limited until now, we have a, a tremendous upside potential to, to work with. And Amarillo Grande is a good example about the potentiality of this country for uranium. Well, one of the other things that we like to ask our guests often is you know, a little bit of discussion about the overall market in which they operate. And, You've been around in the uranium market for a while. You've had experience in some different countries on the exploration side. How do you look at the market today? The market is since time ago showing that the fundamentals represent a challenge for the mining sector. I mean, today uh, we have a almost 25% deficit uh, of uranium uh, supply from primary production, and that represents a gap that we need to cover more if considering that the world have understood the importance of the nuclear energy in the new environmental challenges towards net zero by 2050. That means that nuclear energy as a reliable uh, energy to produce low carbon energy for that transition should play a significant role. In fact, if you see from the information from the nuclear sector, uh, a few years ago, we were talking that it was required to double the nuclear energy to achieve that goal of net zero. Uh, however, that means that today is about 10% of the energy produced in the world nuclear but if you see low carbon energy uh, nuclear represent about 25 percent of that energy but it's supposed that due to the last results coming from the climate change conference 
uh, last December, uh, we should triple that energy in order to achieve that goal. So it's tremendous uh, challenges for the sector. We need to define much more uranium resources to achieve that goal. And this is something that uh, will play a significant role in the entire market of the uranium. If you see, as I mentioned before, I mean, in 2022, the primary uranium production covered about 20, 74% of the requirements. And it's supposed that it's going to be reduced in the next few years due to the those mines that went into standby preserving resources during the low prices period. However, it's expected that that reduction in the gap between supply and demand is not sustainable in the medium long term, uh, basically due to mineral reserve depletion, but also because as many other commodity, it's becoming more and more difficult to do new discoveries. So that is a really challenge. The market also has shown some changes in the last few years. Uh, as I mentioned just recently that, I mean, many mines due to low prices went uh, into standby or uh, shut down their operations uh, because the price was very low. And in, so based on that experience, the long-term contract that were always a significant part of the market in the uranium market because uh, utilities uh, and government trying to preserve stockpiles to secure a nuclear fuel for their reactors. However, we have seen in the last few years that those long-term contracts are being reduced in time and also uh, the condition, the economical condition of those contracts are being changed for a usually in the past uh, long-term fixed prices to now new conditions trying to adjust to market conditions that it could be some combination between fixed price and uh, related to spot price or some index to be applied to that prices. So that means that the market is already considering that the long-term requirement of uranium may potentially be reflected into the uranium price, and that could be something that may help in the sustain sustainability of the market itself. So those things have changed recently, and that is what we should be expecting for the future in, in this industry. Guillermo, thank you for that and quite a constructive setup that we do have in front of us here as well as, as you highlighted some of those areas. Why don't we talk about Blue Sky from a high level overview standpoint for just a moment. You know, we have a newer audience uh, since our last uh, discussion with management there at Blue Sky, but how about just a quick overview of Blue Sky Uranium for our audience and then we'll get into some details. Blue Sky is a company focused in acquiring, exploring, and advancing uranium and vanadium projects into production. Focused today 100% in Argentina uh, at the Patagonia of Argentina, the southern sector of Argentina. Uh, our, our flagship project is named Amarillo Grande, which represents basically three quarters of the entire tenement that the company control today that uh, in total is about 400,000 hectares approximately. Uh, I should say that all those properties are 100% controlled by the company. Uh, so that represents a very good position to be exploring and advancing projects. Uh, in particular, Blue Sky did a significant discovery back in 2006 at this Amarillo Grande project because it was recognized as a new entire uranium district. Uh, the company itself is managed by the Grosso Group, uh, uh, that also control other two companies in, in Argentina or in general, 
uh, one related to lithium and another one related to metals. Uh, and I should say that this, uh, the track of discovery of this group in Argentina, active for the last 30 years also, uh, it's amazing. I mean, they have, or they achieved four discoveries where two of those, uh, like a Macho gold mine in San Juan or Chinchilla led zinc silver deposit in, in the north of Argentina and Jujuy. The first one actually controlled by a Spanish group, the second by SSR. The third discovery was the world largest undeveloped silver project in, in the Patagonia, in Chubut province, actually controlled by Pan American Silver. And finally, Amarillo Grande and the Ivana deposit as the fourth discovery. So it's a company with great experience in Argentina, where his founder, Joe Grosso, uh, had the capacity to understand early in the history of the modern uh, mining history of this country that the geological potential uh, was uh, significant, more if compared to that in the other side of the Cordillera that limited our country almost 4,000 kilometers in the western side, we have Chile with significant geological potential and production. This is the, the group in general. We have a team in Argentina with Argentinian geologists well prepared and trained for the uranium, something that it's not easy to find and the um, trainee geologists into uranium because we are in the entire mining sector. We are uh, just a few geologists with experience in this sector and we are actually training new geologists uh, because we understand that the Mauricio Grande project is so huge that we need to train a young geology for a sustainable exploration program along the, the future. Guillermo, I appreciate the uh, the comments on that. And why don't we look at just capital structure here for just a moment. Um, can you give us an update on the current shares outstanding at the company, the cash balance on hand, and how far you think that carries the company into this year, 2024. And then of course, uh, major shareholders that are on the roster. Well, today we have almost 260 million shares out, uh, where most of that is controlled by insiders, as well a wide retail shareholder participation with US funds. So this is how is in general terms, the company is structured. Uh, our cash on hand is actually just below 1 million because we are expecting, we were just finishing the PEA, uh, a new PEA presented a few weeks ago, and now we are expecting to raise more funds towards the pre-feasibility study that we are launching. That is our expectation uh, for this year. We uh, expect to move that pre-feasibility study as fast as possible, because we understand that we are at very good market condition uh, with a research in uranium price and stabilization of the market that may be very helpful, and we may take it or we may uh, take advantage of that scenario. Uh, so this is basically uh, where we are today. Uh, we expect uh, potentially in the next few weeks launching a private placement uh, to to start that uh, or to continue, I should say, the pre-feasibility study because some of those studies are already ongoing and also to continue with the exploration program that we are following in order to increase the volume of the resources uh, estimated by now. Well, why don't we get into the revised preliminary economic assessment that the company released at the end of February for the Amarillo Grande project. Tell us a little bit about those findings with that preliminary economic assessment, PEA, and what you see as the next steps will be to advance this project. Obviously, pre-feasibility study would be the next logical thinking on sequence anyway, if it's structured that way. This project is a fairly simple project. I mean, it is in Argentina. There's there's a few things that need to be worked out on that front, but generally this project is a fairly simple project. But just talk about the current revised PEA and what your thoughts are coming out of this 
and what you think the next steps will be. This new preliminary economic assessment had the opportunity to show us uh, that, as you already mentioned, this is a, looks like a straightforward uh, deposit that uh, with a very uh, simple metallurgical processing. It's located near surface or on surface, so very easy mining uh, production type. And so what we try to show with this PA is that based on the last change in the few years, not only in the market condition, as I mentioned before, I mean, the price uh, had uh, increased in the, in the last year, basically, but also due to the inflation after COVID-19, the, pr the prices uh, for the CapEx and OPEX uh, were modified. So we had to prove again uh, what we wanted to prove, uh, how it looks this project at this new environmental condition and the upside from the economic point of view. In the other hand, you also mentioned Argentina and those things that need to be considered. Uh, what we wanted to do is to de-risk the project, moving most of the inferred resources into indicated. So if you see the today, 80% of the resources are uh, indicated. That means that we have better knowledge about the continuity of the mineralization along the deposit. So this is something that helped to convert this project into a robust and potential project to move forward into production. That was the goal. I mean, the, if you see the numbers, uh, although we had inflation and the prices in general, not only in Argentina, had been raised the last few years, we are still showing a very low operating production estimation. Uh, we have a cash cost of about uh, $23 per pound, $23.30. Today, the uranium price is about $95 per pound, and this PA was run considering a long-term price of $75 per pound. Uh, so we still expect to be in the very low uh, compared operating potential production uh, in the future, and this is something that represents the robustness of this project. Secondly, if you see the capital expenditure required to open this mine, today we are going or considering about $160 million, including $35 million of contingencies. So this, I mean, it's uh, a relative, relative low costly project to be open, but the more important thing here is that this Ivana deposit is just the first uh, deposit discovery in the entire district, which cover more than 145 kilometers long by 20, 40 kilometers wide sector. As I mentioned before, 100% controlled by Blue Sky. Uh, and what we are doing at the same time that running, trying to move forward the Ivana deposit itself, what we are doing is advancing exploration programs in the surrounding areas of this deposit because we understand that we have potentiality to discover more resources and generate a cluster of deposit that may be potentially feeding a central facility plant at Ivana deposit. So we are running both. We are running, trying to move now more rapidly the Ivana deposit into PFS and potential future production as well as trying to increase resources and extend the mine life of that plan potentially open for the Ivana deposit. You look at this project and obviously here the market so far hasn't had any reaction to the PEA so far and the results of that PEA. This is of course revised, but with the current market conditions, Guillermo, and the status of this project, Given that the market hasn't reacted much and the valuation of this company hasn't reacted that much at all, what do you think really is the next steps needed to really demonstrate that value at the project for that to start being reflected in the share price? 
because right now the market's just not seeing it and it's definitely not being reflected in the share price and that could be for a number of reasons but how do you see with the improvement in uranium prices here how you guys bring attention to this company and what that specific focus really should be for me i think it's production i think you have to speed quickly down the pathway of getting the economic studies sorted out with the confidence skipping right to definitive feasibility moving this down the road of the permitting process and getting that stuff going. But that obviously is going to take some time. Expansion work could certainly be beneficial, but maybe expansion work doesn't necessarily cut it for the market at this point in time. So in your discussions, in your review of this project, the company has the capacity to bring in additional people to look at a production scenario and to actually become a producer. I think that's certainly possible. It's, it has a lot of challenges, but it, it's certainly possible. Um, but what is your thought here about getting more market attention on this company and how we move down the road here towards a better value outcome for investors? We share the, the view of how we should be moving forward with the project itself. We understand that trying to move this towards production as uh, fast as possible uh, is the way to do it. Uh, we are, if you see the valuation of the project in general, not only for this project, if not in the mining sector, we are like in the orphan period. Uh, that period that usually the, the value of the project is reduced or limited until the market already understand that you certainly are going into production because we have a, pro a project that is on surface, potentially low operating cost, future production, strategically located in a district that may extend the life of the project. We have to prove that with specific uh, steps. First, and it's not, I mean, we are, I expect that going to take about no longer than one year, go in, uh, present a pre-feasibility study, trying to continually de-risking those resources into indicated and uh, measured. So we de-risk that part, the technical part of the project. We are also advancing with in-depth metallurgical assessments uh, that we want to prove with more a specific technical information how the processing would be and as delineated from the first uh, study is a simple and well-known technology required for this uh, type of processing and when you say simple and well-known technology mean in general terms lower cost so we are trying to maintain those things, trying to maintain the project as robust as we can from the economic point of view. When the market see that we may move this into production in a country like Argentina, which is a nuclear country with local requirements and uh, already interested in trying to recuperate the self-supply lost more than 25 years ago, uh, that will show to the market uh, the potentiality of this district. And if you see, we, what we found is something that is really big. I mean, it's an entire district, and usually you have a learning curve that takes time until first you, as explorationists, understand the potentiality of the district. But later, you need to show to the market what you are talking about that you probably could understood initially, but need to, to pass that uh, understanding to, to the market. If you see huge districts like today, I mean, Kazakhstan, that from the geological point of view, we have many similarities. I mean, it took decades until Kazakhstan achieved the position that it has today with, I don't know, seven, eight mines in operations. Uh, it took a, a, a time. But we need to start with the first clear uh, moving forward step that is trying to move this deposit potentially with a partner. Uh, we are very good exploration needs, but we understand that we uh, 
uh, it would be strategic to have a partner or probably uh, to to find someone else to, to move this project forward uh, and show the potentiality of the district that can realistically become a new producer. Uh, and this is what we need to, to show to the market. Uh, so the market is, is not easy only for Blue Sky or uh, the junior companies. It's been difficult, but we understand that, that this is a unique opportunity that sometimes it's difficult to understand it by the by the shareholders or the public in general. Uh, we are seeing Argentina trying to move to more open economy, but we are still trying to assess what is happening in Argentina. However, if you see the nuclear policy in Argentina, probably is the one of the just few policies sustained for almost 70 years now. Uh, and it's a country that wants to advance in that direction. Uh, and when you start to understand all those particularities of the of this project where it's located and the capacity to increase its resources in the future based on exploration, that is, we understand are the, the thing that we have to move. But as I, you said, I mean, moving forward is into potentially present it in one year from now, uh, a PFS and trying to be at the decision point uh, to our potential production, that will be the key movement that we are planning to do. Lots of work to do here. Um, and I think it makes a lot of sense to be very clear in the message that needs to get across about the progression of permitting, pre-permitting efforts right now to get those documents in line and in order to submit that information clarity on Argentina as a regulatory regime for uranium use domestically and also export. And then of course, the work necessary to get the confidence level up with respect to actual production. And so I think those things are the areas that should be focused on and should be clearly delineated to the market with very succinct uh, details on the progress of those things. We'll see how things continue to progress. With that, if we've talked Argentina slightly here. I'd like to get a little bit more information from you because you are in Argentina. You understand the dynamics that are there today. Uh, I'd like to have your opinion on the current Argentine administration. And if you see that permitting this project, as we've discussed with some of the challenges related to domestic use and export use of uranium, um, how you see that progressing with the current administration. And then also um, just just overall thoughts of Argentina being open to permitting a uranium project such as this. Okay, as yeah, as I mentioned before, no, many people know still in Argentina how uh, the experience and capacities of Argentina in the nuclear sector. I mean, Argentina is involved in this sector since the 1950s, just a few years after United States and we control every change, or we have capacity to control and knowledge to do it, every sector of the nuclear cycle, from production to uh, energy production. We have our own uh, plans for nuclear fuel production. Uh, we produce energy, we uh, build uh, nuclear reactors, and we start nuclear reactors and we sell abroad, uh, along the world. We have now like four or five nuclear research reactors sold to the different countries. Uh, and the good thing is that all that experience is not found in many countries. I mean, if you see today, the general manager of the en uh, Nuclear Energy Association, the international association, I mean, it's an Argentine. Uh, and that is representing the capacity of the country in this sector. From the mining point of view, Argentina already had nine mines in operation until 1997, when the last one was uh, set into standby. Uh, so we have all the regulations and experience to have uranium mines in production. So it's not something that we need to learn. We have a nuclear authority 
uh, that regulate all the, all the issues related with the nuclear sector in general, and particularly in for mining. And specifically for this project, Amarillo Grande and the Ivana Deposit, we are located probably in the province with more experience in the nuclear sector in Argentina. And why is this? Because it's the, I mean, the main uh, university or college prepared for the nuclear sector. It's in Rio Negro province, well known internationally. The province also has uh, control with the National Atomic Energy Commission, a research nuclear developing company, which is the one that sells the research nuclear reactors in the world, but also migrate to other sectors like radars, uh, medicine, and some other sectors. So it's, it's a very well experienced company. Uh, and not only that, I mean, this province has a pilot uranium enrichment plant. Uh, so, what that means that the province and the authorities in the province they have the capacity and or the chance to talk with the nuclear sector directly because they already control companies or have very good relationship with the nuclear sector and the authorities that regulate the the permits and uh, may grant the, those permits for a mining sector they already gave the permit to that uh, uranium enrichment plant. So they have very good experience. They have well trained and have very good consultant to, to advance in a potential future production, uh, uranium production in, in the province. Uh, and so from that point of view, we expect that the permits wouldn't be more difficult than requesting a, the opening of a gold mine, for example. I mean, because they have all the capacities. It's, it's not easy to find all those positive connections in the same province. Uh, and we are, I mean, and this project is well located, not only due to the geological potential, the place where we are exploring from environmental and social point of view, uh, if not also governance, capacities of the province to permit moving forward of this project. Guillermo, thank you for that. Um, just looking at this, our area of concern here is predominantly commercial reactors in the country represent about five and a half percent of the grid. You had a reactor from 1974, you had one from 1983. The most recent one, of course, commercial scale is uh, 2014. So, you know, it's been about 10 years or so since uh, the last reactor was commissioned there. Again, I'm talking commercial basis, not test reactors. As far as my understanding, and maybe you can educate me here, while there has been production of uranium in the country, that that production has been predominantly state-owned, state-sponsored, or maybe potentially a outside uh, state has been controlling that operation. Do you see that it's really no different in terms of hurdles for a private company to build and start producing uranium? Or do you think that that is maybe an area that uh, is not clear? And I think that's maybe something you can speak of, but then also just how you see the current administration, how the country is receiving the current administration and their ability to basically be pro-mining, if you will, and advancing projects in the country. Okay, yeah, that is a question that, I mean, we did for our own also, I mean, how that looks uh, to see a private company trying to open a uranium mine in, in Argentina when the previous night mines were owned by the federal government, although what, some of those were mined by the private sector. Uh, we understand that uh, the country is mature enough to allow and help and today I should say, and assist the private sector to move a project like a Ivana deposit moving forward. Uh, and it's not something, I mean, if you see in the nuclear sector, we are considering to produce uranium, which is probably the more easy part in the, in the cycle of the nuclear energy. After that, we have, a, we have the capacity in Argentina to 
refine the uranium and to produce nuclear fuel. And that nuclear fuel production company is 100% private. So the private sector is already involved in the nuclear sector in Argentina. Uh, so it's not something so rare. I mean, it's going to be potentially the first a private mine moving into production entirely, controlling the, the mining tenors and going into production. But the sector has matured enough to understand that the best way to improve the knowledge and control of this market, uh, they need to have capacity to be connected for every sector in the cycle. We are not producing today. It's, it's sometimes, I mean, it sounds like ridiculous because we buy raw material, yellow cake from Kazakhstan or Canada, or and we have the capacity to proceed, process all that material until we produce energy. So why we are not producing by our own when we have a tremendous capacity? The government has two big mines, uranium mine, uh, settled waiting to be reopened. However, I mean, due to the economic crisis and Argentina in general, as you probably know, I mean, is the private sector probably the one that have more chances to move this forward today uh, due to the financing capacity. And in the informal conversation that we have, uh, with the people in the local nuclear sector, they are trying to see uh, their, their first goal to recuperate the cell supply of uranium, no matter who produced that uranium. I mean, and this deposit, which could be considered, I mean, medium scale deposit, may already cover 100% of nuclear or uranium requirements for Argentina, and still, you have the capacity at this uh, model uh, run for the PEA, uh, we covered that requirement with half of the production estimated. So we have probably the capacity to cover this 100% requirement of Argentina and export half of the production abroad. So we understand that it, it could be seen like uh, it's rare that the private sector producing uranium, but it's not as rare as, as the people may expect. As I mentioned, the private sector is already in the sector. Uh, the nuclear sector itself uh, has many connections with the private, and the main goal today is to recuperate cell supply. And probably with actual government, this process could be accelerated and going faster than expected, but it's not particularly from this government. It's something that has been moving in that direction for the last 10, 15 years. The nuclear federal policy was relaunched by President Kirchner back in 2006. Uh, and part of that, for example, you mentioned the three nuclear reactors that we have at the grid connected, but we are one of the 10, 12 countries countries trying to connect a small modular reactor into the grid. We are building our own locally developed a small modular reactor, name it CAREM25. And this is under construction uh, and we expect to be seeing uh, the chance to, to connect and be content and be competitive with uh, the other countries trying to to achieve that goal. Uh, so, I mean, this is the the country is trying to advance with all the sectors in the nuclear cycle, and they are are considering with no doubt that the private sector could be providing the the raw uranium for for their nuclear reactors. Look, good luck on the 25 uh, megawatt SMR. Hopefully there's some success. I think it's important to have the ability to export from the country. And the other question, I guess, with that, just how you guys look at, given the capex of this project, 
and I know this is early, but you're in a little bit of a unique situation where there's going to be government discussions, domestic discussions with folks in the country. But is there any discussion yet on financing or offtake for the project, or do you really see that this is way too early given the economic feasibility stage that we're currently in? We understand that we are very good explorationists, and we should be considering how to move this into production and potentially have to find a partnership with a, another company with the capacity to finance and to move a production center into reality. We are advancing on that. I should say that uh, at this recently finished PDAC in Toronto, uh, we have seen uh, many companies interested in a, in our project because we are already talking about moving, moving forward into PFS and potential future production. So uh, we understand that that could be the way to do it, trying to, to find some strategic company that may understand the potentiality of the Ivana deposit itself, not only with the Ivana deposit as the uranium to be produced from there, you know, that's a central facility that may be producing uranium from other uh, satellite deposits uh, in an area that we are today exploring of about 30, 40 kilometers far from, from the Ivana deposit itself. And this could be very economic. And you mentioned, just mentioned that the very low grade that we have, but the good thing that is that this low or very low grade at the Ivana deposit has a particularity that do this very profitable. That is the uranium mineralization is in the very fine material or into poor or unconsolidated sediments. That you can mine that those sediments as a sand quarry. So no, you don't need drilling, flatting, neither crushing. Go into first step of processing which represent uh, scrubbing and screening, and your initial grade is upgraded almost four times because you reduce your volume to a quarter. So although in situ, the grades are a low grade, when you go into the plan, you can upgrade to more seen grades at the Samsung type deposits, about 0.1%. Uh, and that pre-concentrated material is the one that you go into the alkaline leaching processing, which as we could see, uh, recuperates uh, fairly well. We have recoveries about 90% and using a technology that it's environmentally friendly, that also represent lower operating cost is different when when you different use different technologies and this is well known a uh, low operating cost technology and these are the particularities that uh, may help in the in the economics and if you have this first chance to pre concentrate the material you can speculate that if you have other satellite deposits that could be by itself potentially sub-economic or border in the border between economic. You can do it economically because you can pre-concentrate on site with a mobile plant, reducing your volume and upgrading the uranium concentration and that material move into the central facility. So this is a way how you can expand the potentiality of this uh, deposit. So we understand that it's those, I mean, there are companies that understand that potentiality and we expect to see some kind of alliance or business that we can move forward the Ivana deposit first and potentially increase the capacity uh, and extend the mine life with other satellite deposit as we are actually exploring in order to, to achieve that uh, long-term strategy. 
very well and i appreciate that and and i should have clarified by all means i mean look we we do like low grade projects as long as they work with other factors such as scale such as the processing methodologies and all those other parts and pieces that bring this into the right stuff we have no issue with low grade material because obviously as you said there the beneficiation process is to be expected here in your guys's particular case it looks like the beneficiation process is going to work out really well and on top of that, if you have the right scale and other factors besides grade into this, you can have a pretty nice operation. And we've seen that demonstrated in places. Great example, Namibia, as you well know. And so I appreciate uh, the thoughts there on that. And we're looking forward to seeing you guys progress this in a good fashion. Can you discuss just briefly uh, any efforts, any comments that you want to make on local community efforts that the company is uh, progressing on that you want to mention? Yes, certainly, and because it's very important. When we are talking about potential projects moving forward, we need to understand that you need resources, you need the capacity to recuperate that commodity, but you also have to maintain very good relationship with the communities where you are, because you are going into work at their lands, at their sites, uh, so we are very respectful of that. And we need to understand also that we have to do it with as high environmental standard as possible to achieve uh, in order to preserve their territories uh, because we uh, want to be this project as any other project uh, sustainable on time. And that means the new have to work with your stakeholders, which are the landowners and the communities where you are located. Uh, and we have maintaining an excellent relationship with the community where we are located since the beginning. Uh, we are, I mean, most of our employees at the projects are from the small community named Valcheta. Uh, we, are, we have almost 20 employees from there, and some of them many years at the company already and they are part of our voice in the community explaining uh, how important it is to be working in a company like this in an area that really uh, have many economic requirements for the community particularly from the environmental point of view i mean the place to be potentially producing uranium where ivana deposit is located i would say that probably at the best area that i've seen i mean it's a huge depression in the middle of the province desert area very low uh, population density and where closed basin where you have evaporating pots and you have the waters are already salted water that you cannot use for humans neither animals and we may use at, at our processing i would say that the conditions from this point, from environmental, social, and governance point of view, as I mentioned about the province also, uh, we are in a very good and key uh, place to understand that is achievable future production ideas. The last few years, we were working also in the baseline studies, trying to monitor the entire conditions uh, from where we are starting. Uh, we are. We were also working with the community, doing water samplings before drilling programs. Something that is required by law in in this province now. But we are very open and happy to do it because sometimes it's the best way to to create a relationship is being transparent, showing what you do, and it's amazing how the people is surprised sometimes because we are. If you go to Ivana deposit itself, you probably don't recognize where we uh, where the mineralization is because it's all almost as it was found many years ago. So we're trying to maintain that condition. And in this case, because we are talking about mineralization on or near surface in the first 25, 30 meters, uh, we are considering for the potential production to do a backfill remediation while producing. So once you uh, recuperate your uranium from the sediments, 
you backfill following some particular engineer methodology, uh, you backfill your pit or your quarry, and by the end of the production, you are leaving the area almost as when you started the, the production. And the people appreciate that, uh, those efforts done by the company. And that is key, not only for uranium, probably more uh, strategic for uranium, but for any mining project that want to be developed in the area where it's located, that mineralization. That is something that the miners cannot decide, is the natural who decide where the mineralization is. So we need to understand that we are guests in those lands from the locals and, and we try to maintain that relationship in a fair and transparent relationship a long time. Ishiro, thank you for the comments there on community. And why don't we leave it there for now for this program, but we'll leave you with this just last question. For potential investors who are listening in, the company has a market capitalization of about 16 million Canadian dollars. Why should Blue Sky Uranium be considered within the institutional family office and retail investors portfolio at this stage? Well, certainly, as I mentioned, this is a unique opportunity where you may be potentially producing in the medium term scenario. I mean, we are going rapidly into PFS, trying to take advantage of the market condition where we are with a real robust project as expressed in the last preliminary economic assessment. But it's not only for that, it's also because we control about 300,000 hectares district 100% controlled by Blue Sky, where we have the chance to define more discoveries that may extend the mine life of the Ivana deposit, or including, potentially in the future, trying to define other significant deposits, as you can see in similar districts in the world where there are many mines in production. The geology has similarities to some of the bigger actually producing uranium districts in the world. And we understand that uh, it represents a potentiality to create value. In the near term, as I mentioned, we could be probably escaping from this orphan period that is always between discovery and going into production. And we expect to pass forward that orphan period as fast as possible in order to give our shareholders the, re the value that the project itself potentially represents. And for the long-term view, uh, indicating that we have a geological potentiality to define more resources and extend the capacity of, of this project for, for many, many years. And Guillermo, what is the best way for interested parties to reach out to the company? We have in our website, you have a contact uh, link there, email address. Sean Persher is in charge of that. You can contact him whenever you want. And if you have some technical question, he will send the contact to me so I can help give the answer if I can to about the project. Uh, our CEO, Nicolas Kakos, is always open to discuss about the strategy of the company. So probably Sean and that email on the website is the best way to, to do it. Well, Guillermo, thank you again for coming on the program and best of luck advancing Blue Sky in 2024. Thank you. Thank you, you, and I hope it helps to the audience to put into consideration this unique opportunity about a uranium project moving forward into PFS in Argentina, a nuclear country. Thank you.